Week one's done, the pilot's out of the way, Brandon came back, and we're talking about Limitless. Episode two, badge and, or it's not and, just badge, gun. <laughs> Brian, he really wants to be a part of the team, the actual team, the real legit FBI team. He wants to contribute. Like, uh, they have him sitting in the, <laughs> basically a closet, if you will, like, just learning Farsi. Uh, he's, he just feels like he's being underutilized. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, haven't we all really lived through that? Like, come on, I, can, I know I can do more. I mean, I can think of times when, at a job, <laughs> the boss would... Be like, oh, we've never done it that way before. I'm like, okay, so? <laughs> yeah. And so then I just figured out who to go to above that person to convince everybody, all right, this is the way we need to be. And, like, that's not how he does it. He literally busts through a uh, drywall wall to, to to get out and be free. Because uh, the FBI has put two bodyguards on him. He doesn't even learn the names. He calls them Mike and Ike. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, it's, to me, the the, the theme of this episode is... Brian wanting to prove that he is an asset to the team. Like, even when he hears about the mission that uh, Boyle and Harris, his, his basically his two uh, handlers, have, he wants to help, but uh, they, the FBI, is the they. <laughs> um, the FBI, they haven't really gotten that trust in him yet. And so that that's the reason he really stuck in the office mm -hmm. is you know that, that they don't have that that they, they don't trust him like that they want to or that he wants them to. Um, but just like this show has a beautiful new open that debuted last week in this second episode, Limitless the TV show gets its own open that explains everything, which is great for you know a non-streaming TV show. Because it's like, wait, did you miss it last week? This Open's going to catch you right on up with it. And I, I love it when they do things like that. Uh, I mean, obviously it's not necessary uh, in stream in the streaming world, and that's why they've created that magical skip button. Mm -hmm. Oh, but, yeah. <laughs> but uh, it's just, it, I, I like seeing little touches like that when, when a show brings a new element to it. Um, like I said, because I can appreciate it for what it was meant for. And not necessarily for, I, I don't. I know it's not needed now, but mm -hmm. it was. It would have been helpful then, if uh, if you did miss that pilot. Yeah. Um, so. I know I stated it in the first episode, but uh, it just it just gets even more clear here in this second episode that that Brian Fitch is, like I said, he's more Chuck than he is. Eddie Morrow, and I don't say that as an insult. That I love Chuck. I think that's a big compliment. Um, so yeah, it's it's uh, it's fun to how things progress, and the the title of the episode, which is badge exclamation point gun exclamation point, comes from uh, <laughs> it comes from uh, Brian talking to his family about what he's contributing to this FBI mission of his and uh and they know he's basically been a screw up like don't get me wrong he's not done bad things but he's not been successful mm -hmm. throughout his life and so uh they're like oh do you get a badge do you get a gun and, and so when when he goes and talks to Boyle and Harris about it Boyle gives him uh I think it's a hold on yeah it's a tape dispenser that he puts the the word badge on and a stapler that he puts the word gun on uh, just as a gag, and, and I love that Brian takes it in stride. He's like, oh, you're hazing me. Oh, that's fun. You know, now I'm a part of the family, the team. And uh, and so it's just nice that even when he doesn't get what he wants, he can appreciate what is going on, you know, in the world around him. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the things that definitely separate, like, Brian from Eddie is Brian is seeking, like, purpose Oh, absolutely. In the world. Um, 
and being noticed, kind of like what we alluded to uh, last week's episode where uh, the FBI was like, <laughs> you're nobody. Yeah, you're nobody. <laughs> it's like, you, you don't have any, like, good things about you or bad things. You kind of just Yeah, you exist. Wander. Yeah, you just exist. And it's like, wow, that is sad. And, you know, Brian, his parents are like, yes, he's not a screw-up, yeah. but he, he just lacks like purpose mm -hmm. while Eddie is all about uh drive and success. Yes, exactly. And and <laughs> um Brian actually has a a little bit of an Eddie moment in this episode because uh one of Eddie's big quirks was he he used his mind to beat the stock market. Well, Brian doesn't beat the stock market, but he takes the $17 that are in his pocket and turns them into big money uh at a local casino so that he can rebuild uh, models of bombs that he thinks can help help the FBI discover who planted a bomb on a uh, an investigator who got killed and uh, so like I said it was just it was just one of those fun little things that takes what we learned in the film and tra transitions it into the show where it's it's similar but it's also totally different mm -hmm. because the thing that that Eddie's in pursuit of is his own well-being, and the thing Brian's in pursuit of is helping others. And so uh, I once again take the note that I said, ah, look at that, Mark Webb, amazing Spider-Man, good stuff. Um, and so, <sighs> yeah, so uh, another reoccurring theme within this episode is Brian trying to figure out what is the connection between Eddie, uh, Senator Eddie Morrow and NZT. He looks it up on his computer, and things get all wonky, digitized, and uh, messed up. And so, clearly, the Senator's got some uh, <laughs> got his hands in some kind of cookie jar somewhere mm -hmm. because he's, uh, he's able to manipulate the... I don't think it's explicitly Google, but a t Google type thing. Um, yeah, so that's... It just shows you the, the the level of reach that Eddie has don't, uh, gotten to. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah, it's big stuff. Yeah, I mean, uh, so it, it's very interesting to uh, to always have that looming figure in the background of Eddie, because you know somehow he's going to show back up again, but you don't know how or what he's going to necessarily kind of like do when they finally uh absolutely because interact. um so in the the first episode where uh eddie gives brian the shot it's not him personally but his his nurse does it um it's unclear as to what eddie's motivations are to bring brian on board obviously he wants something to do with the fbi stuff but we don't know what specifically and yeah no i i agree i like that that looming figure <laughs> So, like I said, Brian, he broke out from his FBI place and he took his bucks and he turned them into bigger bucks so he could build models to prove that, yo, my, my plan help, uh, will help. And so he, he, he builds his three examples of what the bomb could have been and it actually does pay off. He, he's able to figure out uh, unknowingly that one of the designs is a notorious bomb maker that's codenamed Taurus. They don't explain why, but it's unnecessary. There's... The bomb maker's got a nickname. That's fine, uh, and it's just. Uh, <laughs> um, I I love that this guy is so good at being good, like he, yeah, he keeps doing what the FBI don't want to do because he breaks away from his uh, handlers for a second day in a row, even though the the boss of the place is threatening to to nix the whole plan because she's not a big fan of him. But yeah, he's he's always he's always out to get, uh, he's always out to do good. Mm -hmm. And on the topic of good, I recommend that you pick up this good sixty-eight page graphic novel uh, from the link in the description. My sixty-eight page graphic novel, Everlasting Survivors, Volume One, all day long. There are limited first printings of the Jeff Hicks cover. There are only one hundred, or were only one hundred printed. There are. Not very many still available. And this Nick Crook cover, there were only ever 50 printed, also very limited printings available. When these sell out, there will never they will never be printed again uh, to you know keep them uh, valuable. 
Uh, there will be two new covers, one more from uh, Jeff Hicks and one from February Ferdinand. Um, so, yeah, that was, a, that was a nice little uh, segue, if you will. Uh, yes. So, something that I find interesting about the TV show that I think it dwells deep into later on, mm -hmm. uh, but, and I want to get your opinion about something, Absolutely. is what is success if it's only for yourself? Mm -hmm. Because is there a limit to that, basically? Or is it limitless to always Thank you. I'm unintended. so glad you did that. So glad. <laughs> is, is it limitless to uh, help others? Like, is, um, and, and I find that very interesting. That I'm not sure if that's ever a theme. I haven't, like, researched uh, director's notes or writer's notes and what they were planning to do. But I think that's always a backdrop of, it's like, hey, um, there's a limit to self-fulfillment, but it's limitless if you try to pursue in the help of others. Uh, so This is off topic. Mm -hmm. It's big time off topic. And as a matter of fact, it's... It's a topic that's going to come up at the end of the year, so I'll be as ve uh, be as li with, little with the details as possible. But I feel like that concept, that uh, that limiting self desire and unlimited giving, is the theme of a, a different thing called the Santa Claus. Mm. Uh, <laughs> so I recently rewatched it with you know the holidays in the the rear view, and. Yes, I do believe that is a theme of Limitless, the TV show, which is, you know, Brian is boundless in his wanting to help others, whereas, and honestly, it almost feels like Eddie is boundless in his wanting to help himself. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, um, that contrast between the two is important, but I think that helps um, build the intrigue to the looming uh, Eddie in the background because it's like what can I help him with and would I even really want to help him with it that's another big question because obviously Brian is big on helping uh, so much so that he, he figures out in this episode that uh, it's a, it was a bioweapon that, that got the person killed in the early part it wasn't even a bomb, the bomb went off after he was already dead um, and it was the fact that uh the character, he, he had uh, uh, ties back to Genghis Khan because <laughs> that guy had, every 200 person has, has like some Genghis Khan in him is, uh, is what the show says. I don't know how true that is, but I like the, the idea of it. I think that's pretty funny is that like every 200 people in the world's like, what's up, cuz? Yeah, how you doing? Like... <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, so in the climax of the episode, uh, Brian and Harris, uh, his FBI handler, they go to this uh, this company that's called, I think it's called IDK Technologies. I think that's what it is because it's just kind of funny. But I don't know. Just call it IDK. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that'll work. That'll work. Yeah. And so uh, he meets he meets the boss and he's like, uh, he's like, oh, that guy was a douche. And she's like, yeah, but he didn't give us anything. He's like, yeah, well, I've I've been with guys like that before. So he goes out, he yells out there, but he's like. Hey, I was a temp. If you, if you temps think this guy could murder somebody, email me at... <laughs> ah, crap, I don't have an FBI email. I mean, he, ninja versus bear at whatever... I don't know, something funny like that. It was ninja bear, but it spells it out. And he's like, boom, instantly getting people emailed. I'm like, yeah, I think this guy murdered all these people. And they figured it out. Um, but also, a theme of the episode is that if Brian hates that he has to be dishonest with his family and more specifically than just family is his, his father specifically because for him to agree to work with the FBI he told the FBI to manipulate the the donor list put his pops on top so his dad could uh, continue living on and so his whole family is like oh I don't know how that worked out but it worked out nice for us mm -hmm. uh, which you know is true but his his dad's a lawyer so he's very inquisitive <laughs> um, but the, the lawyer uh, the fact that his dad's a lawyer uh, passed the bar and all this and has still got his credentials is what led to uh, Harris the, the lead FBI lady saying to Brian that you still have attorney client privilege even though 
with the FBI you're not supposed to talk about stuff, which basically means you can tell your dad if you just use this loophole. So Brian's all happy. The, show, the episode's closing out with him about to spill all of his guts to uh, his pops right up until he f finds out that his, his dad's uh, at-home nurse is also the nurse that shot him up with the NZT uh, side effect blocker. And then, he, you know, everything changes. It's just like... He's all he's devastated all over again. And mm -hmm. I don't know I don't know about you, but like Oh, actually I do know about you. I do. So uh me and Brandon have been friends long enough to where that uh we have an understanding. Brandon says, Oh, keep this to yourself. But he knows that there are exceptions to the to yourself rule, which is uh, you know and, and I feel the same way. Like if I said, Hey Brandon, keep this to yourself and he was like well I'm gonna tell you know my dad I'm like that's totally fine I understand mm -hmm. uh, and I just I think that, that that idea is one of the other things that really helps uh, solidify Brian as the legitimate good guy like when Eddie tells someone about NZT it's because he has to when Brian wants to tell someone about NZT it's because he thinks it's the right thing to do mm -hmm. and so uh Anyway, I just, yeah, rambling. Yeah, no, but that's uh, that's spot on. I mean, uh, yeah, it, it, it's just the true contrast between these two characters that's very intriguing. And, you know, uh, Bradley Cooper hasn't shown up yet. and mm -hmm. it, But we know what Bradley Cooper was because of the movie. And I think that um, more movies going into TV shows should use this format. Uh, well, I, I'm not sure if they can get the big name actor to. Well, and that, that's or... that's why that you do it. That's why you do it in this way, right? So I made the pitch to you that I thought Gotham, the TV show, should have been the eight years or however many years it ends up being. But I think it was eight years between the Dark Knight and the Dark Knight Ooh, Rises. Yeah, because if Gotham, the TV show, is showing the downfall of Gotham without Batman, and gives a pseudo-justification, if you will, for Bane's introduction. I just thought that that would make for a really good crossover between a franchise people love and uh, a show that I never personally went, went out of my way to watch because it had no ties to anything. Mm -hmm. Well, that and I saw some of the liberty, liberties they were taking with uh, appearances. Because, uh, like, when I think of Penguin, I don't think of a tall, skinny guy. I think of a short, fat guy. So, yeah. like, I saw, yeah. I saw that guy, and I'm like, uh, uh, what? Yeah. Nah, I'm all right. <laughs> now, I love Benjamin McKenzie, the guy who, play who, yeah. uh, who plays uh, uh, Gordon in the uh, in the Gotham show. But be, I, I know I'm not going to watch a show just for one guy. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm, I'm not, like, infatuated with him. So, I'm like, uh... I mean, you know what kind of tried to do it, What's but that? I think they just strayed and just said we're gonna just do our own thing. Is um, Agents of Shield? Oh yeah, well, <laughs> yes. And so that that's a good a good point. So in the beginning, everything was completely simpatico. It was like that happened, this happened, but the problem was Feige wasn't given the reins to the TV show world, and there was another guy, I forget his name, and because he couldn't have everything. He then kept secrets from his own, like they weren't the left hand wasn't telling the right hand what it was mm -hmm. doing, so they they had to stray away from uh, the foundation that they had built. But you're right in in the beginning that show was perfectly, and even uh, the the Netflix stuff they tried their best to allude to uh, the Battle of New York, exactly yeah, with Daredevil yes. and uh, Kingpin rising from that. And yeah. so um, I, I I think that. This is a good formula with the right people in mind. As, as a matter of fact, just on a little side note, I know HBO Max isn't, and this is the second episode of this show that's given HBO Max thoughts and <laughs> ideas, but like, I don't know if the new DC Universe will be in both HBO Max and in theaters, but if given the opportunity, I would 100% do that. Mm -hmm. Especially in the uh, in the Gotham way, like or any person that doesn't require big budget effects, like 
any street level character, mm -hmm. HBO Max that thing up uh, as much as you can. And and you could even do it with characters like Lois Lane and Jimmy Olsen if you wanted. But you know you almost get to the place where you have to, you know, bring Clark up in there uh, eventually. Mm -hmm. So maybe 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 just stick with Gotham. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I, I I think that the blending of the the cinematic and the the silver screen and or whatever the the small screen and the big screen are a great idea. Yeah. And this this show does that really well it's because for me, two weeks in a row, five star episode, it really heightens my love for the primary uh, character, but also enhances a lot of the ancillary characters uh, and continues with the the questions and makes me want to come back yeah and so uh thank you once again for You're coming welcome. back and thank you for watching tune in this friday come back on monday and see you next wednesday for the wednesday night rewind see ya